Approve all things. Hold fast to that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Alexander Gleason's Is the Bible from Heaven? Is the Earth a Globe? Chapter 1, Part 2 With Commentary! We will now interview a few passages of the Bible, falsely so-called pretentious book, after which we will bring forward those who have written for and against it, and weigh them by their own standard or merits. A Bible Reading 1. What does Peter tell us we are to know first? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 Know this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Private interpretation what does that even mean? 2. How did this prophecy come? New V, 2 Peter, chapter 1 verse 21. For no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men spake from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. There is a difference between a prophecy and a prediction. Men can assume all manner of things, and say, I predict that this sports team will win. As Gleason previously pointed out, a hypothesis is an assumption. However, a prophecy is God saying, this is going to happen. It's not an assumption. 3. Since it came by the Holy Spirit of God, for whose special benefit is it? 2 Timothy 3 16, 17 Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. NV. 4. Does not the scripture belong to the laity as well as to the priesthood? Deuteronomy 29 verse 29, last clause, But the things that are revealed belong unto us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. I think this is tying into what number one said about private interpretation. The scriptures are for everyone, not just a select few. 5. By what are we finally judged? 2 John 12, 48 He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my sayings, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I spake, the same shall judge him in the last day. Why is he talking about all this? A prophetic Bible reading on Daniel and Revelation to show the literal fulfillment of the word. Okay, now we're getting back into proving the Bible. However, I feel like we're kind of beating around the bush when we don't actually read the Bible. So I'm going to go ahead and read this passage that we're talking about so we can avoid beating around the bush. <laughs> Daniel chapter 2 And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep brake from him. I've dreamed a dream. My spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Thing is gone from me! You will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof. You shall all be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show me the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards. 
great honor. Therefore, shew me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will shew the interpretation of it. All of you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me so that you can gain the time till the thing is gone from me. Tell me the dream. And then I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. There is not a man alive that can show thy matter. There is no king, lord, or ruler that asks such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. It is a rare thing the king requires, for there is none other that can show the king his dream except the gods. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Ariok, what is this decree? What fate awaits the wise of Babylon? Death. Why is the decree so hasty from the king? After all these wars, the blood of Judah, Assyria, and Asia. The largest battle of Babylon rages within the king this very hour. Your life for a dream. A dream which the king will not reveal. A dream? Ariok, wait! This need not be. Bring me before the king. I can know the dream. Speak. O oh, king, if thou wilt give me time, I will show thee the dream and the interpretation thereof. My lord, what harm could be done? Then Daniel went to his house, and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire the mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O God of my fathers, who hath given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. I want to point out that this is a written prayer that became scripture. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought Daniel before the king in haste, 
and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Belteshazzar, wisest among the young. Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, shew unto the king. They are unable to show it to you. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And maketh known unto the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known unto thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. I take no credit in this, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. I wish Gleason said more to establish this connection, otherwise it seems pretty random. But I think Gleason is highlighting this for us. Private interpretation. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. Private interpretation would be, this is only for the wisest of wise to know and everyone else is just incapable of knowing it. Daniel was saying, I just know these things because God told me. And by not putting himself up on a pedestal, he's saying, God can reveal things to anyone. This whole alignment with 2 Peter is really fascinating. Thou, O King, sawest and behold a great image, this image, whose brightness is excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The head was of fine gold, the breasts and arms of silver, the belly and thighs, of brass. The form being terrible meaning frightening or really shoddy workmanship. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that there was no place found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That part was about the dream. This part is about the interpretation. And I'll come back to this in a moment. I just want to go back to Gleason for a little bit. Behold the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare, before they spring forth I tell you of them. Isaiah 42 verse 9 6. Who was Daniel? Daniel 1 verse 6 Now among these, captives, were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Michael, and Azariah. I like the way the Bible Project zooms out on this and views the book as a whole. The book of Daniel. The story is set right after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem, and they had plundered the city and its temple and taken a wave of Israelites into exile. Among them were four men from the royal family of David, Daniel, who's later named Belteshazzar, and his three friends, who you probably know by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This book tells of their struggles to maintain hope in the land of their conquerors. 
The book's design seems pretty simple at first. Chapters 1 through 6 contain stories about Daniel and his friends in Babylon, while chapters 7 through 12 contain the visions of Daniel about the future. But this two-part shape is made even more interesting by another design feature, and that's the book's language. It begins in Hebrew, the language of the Israelites, but chapters 2 through 7 are written in Aramaic, a cousin language to Hebrew spoken widely among the ancient empires. But then in chapters 8 through 12, it goes back to Hebrew. This design shows how chapters 2 through 7 are a coherent section, but it also highlights the importance of chapters 2 and 7 for understanding the later chapters of the book. Let's just dive in. Okay, coming back to Gleason now. 7. Who was Nebuchadnezzar? Daniel 1 verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. 8. When did Nebuchadnezzar have a notable dream? Daniel 2 verse 1. And in the second year, B.C. 603, margin, of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know where he's getting B.C. 603 from. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. Wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. When I have an unusual dream, I like to write it down, and as I do so, it starts to segment out. And as it does so, I then start to get thoughts and impressions as to what each segment might mean. I think Gleason is kind of doing the same thing here, segmenting it all out. As he does so, pay attention to what thoughts and impressions come to you. 9. What did King Nebuchadnezzar see? Daniel 2 verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. 10. What was the image composed of? Daniel 2 verses 32 and 33. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Again that appears to be five different parts, not four? 11. What became of this image? Daniel 2 verses 34 and 35. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out with, out hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the winds carried them away, that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Note, by comparing Jeremiah 25 verses 32 and 33 with Daniel 7 verse 2 and Revelation 17 verse 15, we understand that the winds are a symbol of war and strife, hence, we conclude it is the latter that God uses to depopulate and destroy the political world. That could be so, but I think I see something different. I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's go over the interpretation now. This is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. What did the image represent? Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the flat earth, as my friend Mark Barnum would point out, and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. As king implies a kingdom, and the following verse says, After thee shall arise another kingdom. Inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. We therefore understand the gold to represent Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and not Nebuchadnezzar in person. As far as I can tell, each segment represents a different time period. You, Nebuchadnezzar, shall be succeeded by the Medes and the Persians. So what does it mean for a kingdom that has already been destroyed to be destroyed again by the stone cut out of the mountains? This is my friend Derek Tyler. There are unfulfilled prophecies in the book of Revelation and throughout the prophets of, of the destruction, the utter destruction of Babylon. And many um, futurists who happen to be dispensationalists, which I am, uh, 
believe that Babylon will rise again as a great international city of commerce and power um, and that it's not a a uh, a synonym for Rome or anything like that. They're talking about actual Babylon on the plains of the Shinar, the Shinar okay. plain where the, the tower of Babel was built. Uh -huh. um, That's really interesting. You're viewing them all together, seeing it all as one picture. Yes. Babylon fell and was destroyed, but they didn't cease to exist. They continued to exist just as so many of the other nations there. And so, yes, there's a time period, but they're all standing there together. Wow. And it hits the, the feet, which are made of a mixture of clay, uh, of, of miry clay. Daniel didn't point out the miry clay in the part where he was telling what the dream was, but he mentions it in the part where he's giving the interpretation of the dream. I'll come back to that in a moment. Continuing in Daniel chapter two, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. 13, you took the kingdom following Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel five verse 31. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. B.C. 538. 14. What other direct testimony have we for the consecutive kingdoms, following Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom? Daniel 8 verses 20 and 21. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great born that is between his eyes is the first king. History tells us that Alexander the Great was the first king of Grecia, therefore, we have direct and positive testimony for the three first universal kingdoms of the world. Okay, so now Gleason is jumping ahead to a different vision that Daniel had and is tying the two together. I'm going to go back to the Bible Project again really quick, which does a good job of painting the big picture of the book of Daniel as a whole. Chapter 1 introduces the basic tension of the first half of the book. Daniel and his friends, they're really wise and capable, and they're recruited to serve in the royal palace of Babylon. But they're pressured to give up their Jewish identity by living and eating like Babylonians and violating the Jewish food laws found in the Torah. So they refuse, and they choose faithfulness to the Torah, and it puts them in danger. But God delivers them, and they end up being elevated by the king of Babylon. After this begins the Aramaic section, which you'll see has this really cool symmetrical design. I believe this symmetrical design is called the chiasmus, and it's when a biblical writer chooses to teach a given set of principles in a certain order, like one, two, three, four, and then they reverse that order, four, three, two, one. I made a video a while back about the parable of the ten virgins and how it is also written as a chiasmus. It's worth checking out. So first, the king of Babylon has a dream that, it turns out, only Daniel is able to interpret. It's about a huge statue made of four types of metal, and it symbolizes a sequence of kingdoms, and the head is Babylon. But then a huge rock comes flying in, and it shatters the statue, and it becomes this huge mountain. Now, this dream is the first of many symbolic visions in the book, and this one introduces the basic storyline of them all. Daniel says that the statue represents a train of human kingdoms following from Babylon, and they will all fill God's world with violence. But one day, God's kingdom will come and will confront and humble the arrogant kingdoms of this world and fill the world with the healing justice of God's reign and rule. After this, chapter 3 tells the famous story of Daniel's three friends who refused to bow down and worship a huge idol statue, which, like the statue in chapter 2, represents the king and his imperial power. And so the friends are persecuted, they're thrown into a fiery furnace, but God delivers them from death and they're exalted by the king who now acknowledges their God as the true one. So here, having a head of gold, we can view King Nebuchadnezzar's statue as being an idol. And I think it's interesting how every part of the statue is made of a specific material. 
And then comes a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, and we have no idea what material it's made out of. It's just a stone cut out of a mountain without hands. And as I think about it, there's a term for that. It's called an unhewn stone. And it's specific in different places in the Bible. Here is Exodus chapter 20, verse 25. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. So this is a stone that you would use to build a sacrificial altar with. It's significant and has symbolic meaning, particularly in Daniel's day. After this come a pair of stories about two Babylonian kings, the father, Nebuchadnezzar, and then his son, Belshazzar. They're both filled with pride because of their imperial power. And so, like in chapter 2, God warns them both through dreams and then visions, which, also like chapter 2, only Daniel can interpret. He says that both kings are to humble themselves before God, and both kings arrogantly resist. So Nebuchadnezzar is stricken with madness. He becomes like a beast in the field. But then he humbles himself before God, and his humanity returns to him. He's restored as king. This is in contrast with his son, Belshazzar, who doesn't humble himself before God, and he's assassinated that very night. Now, these two stories draw this imagery from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and Psalm 8, where humans are depicted as the royal image of God. He's given them authority to rule over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air on behalf of God, who is the world's true king. But when human kingdoms forget that, when they rebel and make themselves and their power into a god, God, they become less than human, like violent beasts who will face God's justice. There is a term called secular humanism, which essentially describes the worship of man. When the idol of man falls and is replaced by an unpolluted stone worthy of an altar of sacrifice, we get a depiction of men ceasing to worship man and a return to men worshiping the Creator. Which brings us to chapter 6, the pair of chapter 3. And this time it's Daniel who's being persecuted because he refuses to pray and worship the king as a god. They refuse to worship a man. And so like the friends, he's sentenced to death and he's thrown into a lion's den. But God delivers him from the beasts and like the friends, the king exalts Daniel and praises his god. Which brings us to chapter 7. It's the pair of chapter 2. This is a big part of why Gleason is pairing the two together. And the center of the book where all its themes come together. It's another dream, but it's Daniel's this time. And ironically, he can't understand the dream until an angelic messenger explains it to him. He sees a series of four beasts, one like a lion, then like a bear, then one like a winged leopard, each of these symbolizing an arrogant kingdom. And last of all is a super beast identified as a really evil empire. And it has lots of horns, a common symbol for kings in the Old Testament. And there's one specific horn who who is an image of an arrogant king who exalts himself above God and persecutes God's people. Now, they are symbolized by a figure called the Son of Man, who's an image for both God's covenant people, but also for their king from the line of David. But then all of a sudden, God, who's called the Ancient of Days, comes and he sets up his throne. He destroys the super beast and he exalts the Son of Man on the clouds where he comes up to sit at God's right hand and share in God's rule over the nations. We can look back now and see how all of these stories in the first half fit together. The three stories of faithfulness despite persecution, these are meant to offer hope to God's suffering people among the nations. But they suffer because human kingdoms have rebelled against God and have become beasts. And so these visions encourage patience, that God's people are to wait for him to bring his kingdom and rule over our world and vindicate his suffering people. But it raises the question about when God is going to do that, and that that's what these final three visions set out to explore. All right, that's a good pausing point. We'll come back and talk more about that in part three. This message has been brought to you by the Flat Earth Institute of Science. With a shout out to my Flat Earth friends at jdecals.com, an amazing place for custom decals. Science.